So let me say on the outset, the purpose of this study is not to be provocative nor to be incendiary, but to honor God by helping Christians think through the weightiness of the implications of present-day politics and our responsibilities as citizens in the United States of America. Make no mistake, not all political platforms are equal. Just reading through the books of 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles witnesses to the fact that not all administrations are equally righteous or unrighteous. You go through those books and you see that some hastened evil, others reversed it. And as Christians living in a constitutional republic, we have a unique opportunity to either accelerate evil and societal decay, potentially, or to slow it, potentially. We can either be complicit in the wickedness that is enabled through legislation, or our vote can be a proverbial brick in the wall that is holding back, potentially, further wickedness in our land. We live in a place where we have a representative form of government. And as a result, the citizens of the United States of America have a responsibility to help direct government policy that will affect the lives of millions of people, born and unborn alike. And make no mistake, despite the surprising and saddening conclusions that some prominent, well-known evangelical Christians have made, make no mistake, this is not a matter that is difficult to discern. This is not like one of those eschatological matters where you're trying to figure out and you're like, well, where do we land on this? I'm not really sure what's going on here. This is a matter, with all due respect, that is easily discernible. And I hope to make that case to you through the Scriptures. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to have it proved out through the Scriptures. And that's what this time is meant to do. I don't want to take that for granted. The elders and myself are desirous for you to know why. To know why it is inconceivable, inconceivable in our minds that a Christian, unless completely unaware of the issues and unaware of a lot of biblical texts, inconceivable in our minds that at this point in history a Christian could support the Democratic Party. And why, we would argue, it's of great importance that Christians vote, but not only vote, but articulate a Christian worldview in response to a democratic party that has adopted positions that are diametrically opposed to God's will. With that said, let's consider what is perhaps the clearest divide between the democratic party and the republican party, the subject of abortion. In a recent town hall event, Vice President Joe Biden, in response to a question that concerned what he would do as president in light of the nomination of Amy Comey Barrett to the Supreme Court, he stated the following. Number one, we don't know exactly what she will do, although the expectation is that she may very well move to overview, overview overrule Roe. And, but the only thing, the only responsible response to that would be to pass legislation making Roe the law of the land. That's what I would do. Suffice it to say, the Democratic nominee is so in favor of preserving the practice of abortion that even if the Supreme Court ruled to overturn Roe v. Wade, he would seek to see its practice preserved via legislation through the Congress. Of course, the prospect of packing the Supreme Court with more judges, seeing that our nation's highest judiciary, judicial body is not an impartial interpreter of the law, but essentially a rubber stamp for the leftist agenda, is on the table as well. Since the decision of Roe versus Wade, approximately 61 million babies have been aborted in the United States of America. I'm not trying to be grotesque, but when you consider what happens in that process, when you consider a baby cringing at the forceps that are coming towards the baby, when you consider the severing of the baby's spinal cord at the neck, when you consider the different ways in which this takes place, the thought of 61 million babies approximately being murdered in their mother's womb, in their mother's wombs, 
should stir our consciences. Note that figure does not include the legalized abortions that took place in states like California and New York prior to Roe versus Wade. But sadly, the Democrats have become more cavalier in their pursuit of the destruction of unborn life. One only needs to listen to Kathy Tran when she had presented the third trimester abortion bill that was backed by Democratic Virginia Governor Ralph Northam. When asked about how late in a pregnancy a, a physician could choose to perform an abortion for the sake of a woman's mental health, she responded saying, I mean, through the third trimester. The third trimester goes all the way up to 40 weeks. Okay, but to the end of the third trimester. Yep, I don't think we have a limit in the bill. In response to further questioning, she even went on to state that according to her bill, a physician could choose to perform an abortion even if a woman was dilating and showing signs that she was about to give birth. It's worth noting that Senator Kamala Harris, the vice presidential candidate for the Democrat Party, went to Springfield, Springfield Virginia to stump for Kathy Tran and to support her reelection. On the other hand, whatever you think of President Trump personally, the fact is that his administration has been demonstrably pro-life. Per the National Right to Life organization, President Trump, quote, restored the Mexico City policy, which prevents tax funds from being given to organizations that perform abortions or lobby to change abortion laws of host countries. He later expanded the policy to prevent $9 billion in foreign aid from being used to fund the global abortion industry. If you knew nothing else about what the current administration has done, with regards to abortion, then you know now that $9 billion in foreign aid that would have been used to support abortions globally has not been. Along those same lines, another quote. The Trump administration cut off funding for the United Nations Population Fund due to that agency's involvement in China's forced abortion program. End quote. Yet another quote. President Trump's, this is in 2018, President Trump's Health and Human Services Department issued regulations to ensure Title X funding does not go to facilities that perform or refer for abortions. Now, you don't have to take the word of the national right to life. A simple visit to the Biden-Harris website, www.joebiden.com, shows how pro-life the president's administration has been. On the Joe Biden website, it states that his ticket wants to, quote, restore, note the word restore, restore federal funding for Planned Parenthood. It goes on and he says that they also would like to rescind the Mexico City policy. It goes on and says that President Trump reinstated and expanded. And furthermore, among other things, the site states, quote, Vice President Biden supports repealing the Hyde Amendment. The Hyde Amendment is what prevents the use of federal slash taxpayer funds to pay for abortions with certain exceptions. All of this stands in stark contrast to not only the way in which the current administration has sought to mitigate the amount of unborn blood that has been shed with U.S. funding, but it stands in contrast to the Republican Party platform. The Republican Party platform, stated in 2016, adopted once again as it is in 2020, states the following. We assert the sanctity of human life and affirm that the unborn child has a fundamental right to life which cannot be infringed. We support a human life amendment to the Constitution and legislation to make clear that the 14th Amendment's protection apply to children before birth. Conversely, while the Democratic Party argues for a woman's choice to undergo an abortion, they do not take into account the life of the child, nor do they take into account what God's word has to say about the matter. 
According to God's word, murder is wrong. Genesis 9, 6, Matthew 15, 19, and many other verses could be stated. And the Bible clearly identifies unborn children as persons. You look in Luke chapter 1, verse 44, and we see that John the Baptist, while he was in his mother's womb, he leaped for joy. So as a baby within the womb, he experienced joy. But furthermore, in Luke chapter 1, you see this in verse 41 and in verse 44, John, while in the womb, is identified as a brephos in the Greek. It's a word for baby. It's the same word that's used to describe Jesus in Luke chapter 2 as a baby outside of the womb. So according to the scriptures, a baby is a baby. A brephos is a brephos inside of the womb and outside of the womb. Furthermore, Old Testament texts like Jeremiah 1.5 and Isaiah 49.1 and others could be communicated and cited as well, show that God is the one who forms a child in the womb and calls individuals from the womb. And under the Mosaic law, if men fought and as a result of their fighting, a woman with child gave birth prematurely, resulting in the child's death, then arguably, according to the way the literal Hebrew here is rendered, the death penalty was rendered for the offending party. As the principle goes, life for life. Exodus 21, verses 22 and 23. All that to say the scriptures in numerous ways regarded those within the womb as persons, as babies, as infants capable of emotion, as individuals deserving legal protection. And when the Democratic Party fiercely fiercely advocates abortion, they advocate murder. And they should not be advocated by Christians. But conversely, it should be the prerogative of Christians to see that the shedding of innocent blood, which God hates, be mitigated and or stopped. And a vote, a vote against the Democratic Party and a vote in support of the Republican Party is one way to do that. Issue number two, sexuality, gender, and marriage. It's likely safe to say that the overwhelming majority of Americans have not read through the platforms of either the Republican or Democratic Party. But in reading at least some of it, you will find things that are quite revealing. Take, for instance, the following from the 2020 Democratic platform. Federal contractors should be required to develop and disclose plans to recruit and promote people of color, women, LGBTQ plus people, people with disabilities and veterans, and be held accountable for delivering. So, the LGBTQ plus movement is so celebrated by the Democratic Party that it sees such practices Practices that the scripture clearly identifies as sin as vehicles in themselves for recruitment and promotion. They have moved well beyond the pursuit of altering the definition of marriage as between one man and one woman as opposed to in light of God's original intention for marriage. The Democratic Party is seeking to socially engineer a society in which the practice of behaviors that are so strongly denounced in God's word, move ones, such ones, to the front of the line of certain employment opportunities. Per the Democratic Party's platform, they are essentially incentivizing sinful behavior. Furthermore, in a recent town hall, Vice President Biden, in response to a woman's question, appeared to affirm the decision of an eight-year-old to become transgender when he said the following. The idea that an 8-year-old or a 10-year-old decides, you know, I decided I want to be transgender. That's what I think I'd like to be. It'll make my life a lot easier. There should be zero discrimination. 
Leaving aside the implications of Biden's earlier reference in that exchange to changing the law, and that's what he would do, he said, which is a likely reference to the Equality Act. And leaving aside how that law being passed, along with a packed Supreme Court, could mean the end of religious liberty as we know it in our nation, as well as parental rights. And leaving aside how accommodating the transgender movement is eliminating protections for women and girls in restrooms, in dressing rooms, in shelters, in prisons, and in sports. In my estimation, another immediate and significant issue here is that you have a person running for the highest office in our land, the President of the United States of America, who showed no sign of concern that a young child could make a decision to potentially undergo things like surgery and hormone therapy in an attempt to change and alter their innate and God-given God -given gender. According to the scriptures, God made people, men and women, male and female, He created them. And He made them in His image. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. There are only two genders. Genders are not the result of social constructs, nor can they be changed as a result of a person's desires or feelings. God has made human beings, male and female. So already we can see that the Democratic Party presidential candidate is for advancing the cause of seeing children dismembered and murdered in the womb. He is pro-incentivizing seriously sinful behaviors. And he is an advocate for children rejecting the way that God designed them and embracing a form of behavior that is wicked in God's sight. Like the Marxist organization BLM that wants to destroy the nuclear family an organization that is affirmed and applauded by so many Democratic candidates. It appears the Democratic Party, like BLM, wants to see people freed from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking. The Democratic Party affirms that which God forbids, and it calls good that which God calls sin. In the Old Testament, homosexuality was identified as sin in no uncertain terms. You can see that in Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13, for instance, where it is explicitly called an abomination. And the behavior of cross-dressing, where men and women would reject the distinctiveness of their gender, and men would embrace the effeminate, and women would embrace masculinity, was identified in like manner. Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 reads, a woman shall not wear man's clothing, nor shall a man put on woman's clothing. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord, or Yahweh, your God. The New Testament, likewise, condemns the practice of homosexuality. In the opening chapter of Romans, for instance, the scripture cites homosexuality with reference to an individual being given over to sin. The practice of homosexuality is described as, quote, passions of dishonor, Romans 1.26, quoting the ESV, against nature, shameful, verse 27, error, also verse 27. And after listing more sins, God's word identifies the sinfulness of people who not only commit such sins, but affirm those who do them, Romans 1, verse 32. So the problem per Romans 1 is both in the practice of homosexuality as well as the approval of it. Now, as I've said before, and I'll say it again, any godly Christian would affirm the inherent dignity of someone who is either given to or struggling with the sin of homosexuality. And any godly Christian would affirm the reality of struggling with or battling against one kind of sin or another. But a Christian cannot call sin good if God has called it sin. A Christian can love such a person, pray for such a person, extol their abilities, help them with tangible needs, and so on. But a Christian cannot encourage a person in sin, affirming rebellion against God's will and God's ways. Thanks be to God, there is forgiveness for sins of all varieties and types through repentance and faith alone in the personal work of Jesus Christ. Whether it be abortion, homosexuality, 
The early church had their share of those who left behind abortion as a result of faith in Christ. You just need to read 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, and be reminded that Paul told the church of Corinth, such were some of you, but they were washed and they were sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now it is worth noting that although it is not always reflected in the speech of candidates, the Republican Party website does state the following, again, via their platform. Foremost among those institutions is the American family. It is the foundation of civil society, and the cornerstone of the family is natural marriage, the union of one man and one woman. A little bit later on, we read the following. Our laws and government's regulations should recognize marriage as the union of one man and one woman and actively promote married life as the basis of a stable and prosperous society. For that reason, as explained elsewhere in this platform, we do not accept the Supreme Court's redefinition of marriage and we urge its reversal, whether through judicial reconsideration or a constitutional amendment returning control over marriage to the states, end quote. The Republican Party's platform agrees with the biblical stance that marriage cannot be altered by people or redefined by people. When God created Eve, she was a helper comparable to Adam. Genesis chapter 2, verse 20. She wasn't the same as him. She was different in design, though equal in value and dignity. And she had a unique role to fulfill in marriage and in the family as seen in language that is used both before and after the fall. There was and is a complementary nature between man and woman. But beyond complementarity, there is compatibility for procreation. Same-sex partners cannot have both partners participating in the roles assigned for husbands and wives. And their inability to reproduce witnesses to have such a relationship is not only against nature, but against the Creator's design for marriage. So the question becomes this. How can a Christian support a political party that raises its fist so furiously and defiantly against God's design of marriage and God's distinct design of men and women as men and women and not support a political party who at least, per their platform, is standing to defend the preservation of those sacred distinctions. Issue number three, Romans 13, Responsibilities and the Role of Government. One of the major differences between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party concerns opposing perspectives concerning the role of government and the responsibility of governing authorities to fulfill their Romans 13 responsibilities. And while media outlets like CNN and MSNBC will not show their viewers all the many clips of the rioting and violence that has plagued major American cities or how Democratic mayors largely have sought to enable violence or have sought to defund the police or downplay the looting, it is important that Christians understand that these things are happening and how to respond biblically to these things. And what can be missed is that per the scriptures, governing authorities have a responsibility to punish evil, to protect those who do good and preserve peace. Romans 13 verses 3 and 4 reads as follows. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So principally, per Romans chapter 13, verse 3, rulers are not, they should not be, a terror to good works, but to evil. So rulers should not antagonize, threaten, impede, or punish good works. As an aside, this is why many Americans are frustrated that Democratic governors, largely, 
have allowed small businesses to be destroyed by looters or forced to stay shut, even though many big box stores have stayed open. This is why citizens have been frustrated that protests have been supported and that hundreds of people can crowd into places like supermarkets and Home Depot. Yet in many cases, churches have been dealt with undue, unduly restrictions or forced in some cases to stay closed. Rulers should not be a terror to good works, but they should be a terror to evil. Now, when governing officials begin to call evil good and good evil, you have a problem, a big problem. When their worldview becomes so twisted and when their sense of morality becomes so upside down, they will be a terror to good works, thinking that they are a terror to evil. And they will enable evil to go in some measure, unpunished, exercising, exercised freely, and mitigating obstructions to the practice of lawlessness and evil. But it should not be like that. Government should celebrate and commend the doing of good in society. As the second half of verse 3 notes, do what is good and you will have praise from the same. So the government should really be commending and praising the good works of its citizens and properly defining what good works are. As Christians, even as that verse says to us, do good. Christians are to do good. Worshiping God. Loving their neighbor. Praying for their leaders. Being a good citizen. Paying their taxes, etc. The description of what a governing official should be is seen in verse 4. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now that phrase at the beginning of verse 4, for he is God's minister to you for good, is a reminder that the government is not God. And it's a reminder that governing officials are not lowercase g gods. Rather, that governing officials are to see themselves as God's servants. That they have a stewardship that is temporary, for which they are accountable to the living God. They have a ministry to perform to do good to their citizenry. So governing officials are to be ministers or servants to the citizenry for good. Well, how do they do good to the citizens that they serve? Well, in light of this text, by providing protection for those in society who seek to live lawfully and peaceably and by punishing those who do not. So the government should protect the private property of citizens by punishing theft. The government should protect citizens by empowering law enforcement to stop rioting and looting and by punishing rioters and looters. The government should protect citizens by seeing that those who lawfully protect themselves are treated not as societal villains or as the real cause of problems, but they should punish those who threaten and do physical harm to others. So what does this have to do with the upcoming election, yet alone other elections? Sadly, the Democratic Party has shown an increasing pattern of governing in ways that are diametrically opposed to these biblical standards. One, within recent months, we have seen major spikes in violence in major American cities. And a common denominator largely shared among these cities is that they are under democratic governance. Take cities like Philadelphia, our own city, New York, which according to at least one statistic has seen an increase of 127% in shootings when compared to last year. It's not to mention Seattle or Portland, Minneapolis just to name some, Kenosha. Many police officials have remarked that they have been told to stand down by democratic governing officials who rather than protecting law-abiding citizens and their property have protected law-breaking rioters and enabled their rioting. Now, this warped view of justice was further illustrated by the behavior of the vice presidential candidate on the Democratic Party side, Kamala Harris, who June 1st tweeted the following, if you're able to chip in now to the Minnesota Freedom Fund to help post bail for those protesting on the ground in Minnesota. 
As reported by Tucker Carlson of Fox News, numerous Joe Biden staffers had also joined in that endeavor, which led to things like the following, quote, they freed a person who's being held for trying to kill the cops, murder them. They also bailed out an accused murderer and a twice convicted rapist, among many others, close quote. Instead of leading the way, in making personal donations to businesses that were ravaged and destroyed, Senator Kamala Harris, Joe Biden staffers, and many in Hollywood did their part to get the people who were arrested for things like theft or defacing public property or acting violently or attacking police officers, even in some cases attempting murder, to get back out there. And make no mistake, part of what Joe Biden has pledged to do is end cash bail in every state so that criminals like the ones mentioned can essentially be brought in and re released shortly thereafter into the very same communities and neighborhoods that they previously criminalized. Number two, many Democratic governors have imposed extended shutdowns, excessive and or illogical government mandates, and disproportionately applied laws for a virus that, according to the CDC, has a survival rate of over 99% for infants through the age of 69 years old, and a survival rate of 94.6% survival rate for those 70 and above. And that's not even taking into account the arguably inflated numbers that they are using to measure this. All of this has had serious effects on families, individuals, both young and old, businesses, livelihoods lost, missed medical appointments, family members who weren't allowed opportunities to be with dying loved ones, and so on. Though not exclusively found in Democratic blue states, it has been predominantly found in Democratic blue states. And the last point under this heading, they, Democratic leadership, governors and so on, especially early on in the violence and in the riots. The tune changed later on publicly. Then you have fact checkers trying to rewrite history. Early on in the violence, they joined in the chorus of slandering police. Some called the police systemically racist. Others called for defunding the police overlooking and sometimes just not even communicating the details surrounding the police shootings and not communicating how very few unarmed people of different nationalities are killed by the police and how even in many of those cases when you read about those cases there are important variables to consider like individuals attacking and trying to hurt police officers etc Please know from a biblical perspective, the scriptures state, Proverbs 17, verse 15, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to Yahweh. Proverbs 18, 5, quoting from the ESV says, it is not good to be partial to the wicked or to deprive the righteous of justice. The Democratic Party seeks to move our country further in the direction of socialism. One of the more troubling trends in our society is the move towards socialism, often identified as democratic socialism. How might democratic socialism, the kind that is embraced by some prominent Democrats and has influenced many of the Democratic Party's policy positions, how might it be described? Well, the Constitution of the Democratic Socialists of America states the following, quote, We are socialists because we share a vision of a human social order based on popular control of resources and production, economic planning, equitable distribution, feminism, racial equality, and non-oppressive relationships, end quote. The problem might not be apparent at first, but notice the democratic socialists want popular control of things like resources and production. 
So it sounds like everybody has some measure of control. Everybody has some share, some place at the table. But in reality, it simply enhances the power of those who are in power, making them the ruling class, enabling them to do things like confiscate and redistribute people's wealth and whatever else they want to do under the justification that they represent the majority. Under the banner of the people decide, it's they, the people in positions of power, that decide what is done. Democratic socialism is marked by an entitlement mentality. It's very common to hear adherents of democratic socialism speak of people being entitled to free this and free that. This is very well illustrated in the words that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez spoke, I believe, at John Jay University. Quote, you have a right to a job, a right to education, a right to a dignified home, a right to a dignified retirement, and a right to health care. So leaving aside the dangerous and divisive ways that democratic socialism uses identity politics to carve up society into segments that they turn against one another, slanderously identifying certain people groups as oppressors just by virtue of, say, them being a demographic majority within the land. Leaving that aside for another time, I want to briefly outline some of the problems with this economic and governmental policy from a biblical perspective. The Bible does not affirm an axiomatic statement like, from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. That's essentially the means through which you get the people the rights you told them that they are entitled to. The Bible, however, teaches that if an able-bodied man can work and doesn't, he shouldn't eat. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. Proverbs states that lazy hands make a man poor. The Bible teaches that individuals have the responsibility of providing for their families, not the state. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. The Old Testament says that a good man lays up an inheritance for his children's children, Proverbs 13, 22. Not that his inheritance belongs to all children, or that his earnings ought to be equitably distributed to the entire collective community so that everyone can enjoy whatever the politician has identified as a dignified right that they have. Second point, whereas democratic socialism espouses, quote, popular control of resources and production, close quote, which means government control under the guise of everyone's control, the scripture, however, nowhere calls for popular or governmental control of the means of production or resources. It advocates individual ownership of that which is not sinful. You take, for example, Abraham. Abraham was, quote, very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Genesis chapter 13, verse 2. And he had herdsmen who worked for him and managed his livestock. Genesis chapter 13, verse 8. God did not call Abraham to forfeit control of resources and production to the common ownership of society. He was allowed to own the means of production and provide herdsmen with opportunities for work. In the Mosaic law, hired servants were to be paid their wages at the end of each day, Leviticus 19.13. So you had, if you will, employer-employee relationships within Old Covenant Israel. Boaz, who in many ways was the model of a godly business owner, owned land and he had levels of employee management. You can see that in Ruth chapter 2. Furthermore, so as to be clear, the Bible also affirms the ownership of private property as opposed to this idea that you'll own nothing and you'll be happy because everything belongs to everyone. The commandment, you shall not steal, implies the ownership of private property. And people are free to do with their property what they will. Take, for instance, the reference in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45, concerning those in the New Testament church who sold their possessions and distributed the proceeds to those who were in need. This was voluntary giving, not a forced, mandated giving. And besides that, it was a descriptive period. It was descriptive of a period of early history and not a prescription 
of how church life should be everywhere at all times. Seizing opportunities, yes, but not mandated from the top down by human beings. A little bit later on in the book of Acts, Peter told Ananias, who lied about bringing the total proceeds of his recently sold land to the apostles for use in the Christian community, Acts chapter 5, verse 4, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? The idea being, Ananias could have given a smaller portion or a large portion of the proceeds. He could have done what he wanted to. It was up to him. There wasn't a percentage mandate from the apostles, yet alone a mandate to bring all to be evenly distributed within the community. God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. And he doesn't want people giving reluctantly or under compulsion. And that does not displace the need for taxes within a society. We see that affirmed in places like Romans 13. But it also tells us that the government should not superimpose upon individuals within the society generosity, as they term it. Third point, contrary to democratic socialism, which seeks to use policies to impose economic equality, the Bible does not mandate the imposition of economic policies to impose equality. Just to be clear. The Bible clearly states that those who were rich in the New Testament church, they were to be generous, they were to be rich in good works, ready to give and willing to share. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18. But the amount, the amount of their giving was not regulated or mandated. Elders in the local church did not have to put prescriptions in place so as to elevate the poor from a lower economic standing to a higher one and to lower those in the higher economic standing to a lower one so as to have economic equality. Generosity, yes. Enforcing economic equality, no. No. Christian servants were not supposed to unite and overthrow their masters. Christian masters were to treat their servants with dignity, dignity and without threatening, but they were not to give them equal shares of ownership of what they owned. The poor were not to envy the rich. The rich and the poor were to be coming together as one Man in Christ Jesus, one group of individuals bought by the blood, and they were to worship together. And part of what made that worship so beautiful was that they were different in so many ways, yet united in Christ. Amen. Fourth under this point, only one more under this heading. In a capitalist society, factors like supply and demand, scarcity and plenty, the uniqueness of a person's skills, abilities, and knowledge contribute to the prices of goods and the wages of workers and so on. Under democratic socialism, the government sets the parameters, punishing success by sovereignly distributing the rewards of someone else's labor to whoever they esteem should get it. You might say they're favored constituencies. Democratic socialism essentially demotivates economic growth by taking away normal, healthy motivations to work, like earning for the purposes of saving for posterity or giving to people or a cause that one so chooses, while the government, which either owns or over-regulates the means of production, also controls the means of imposing a classless society. That's part of what makes democratic socialism so dangerous. Because then, as opposed to a capitalist society where you have the government with the responsibility to protect the rights of individuals and enable lawful and appropriate commerce in a society under democratic socialism, same could be said about communism, the government, which bears the sword, has the means to control imposing a classless society because then the economy and the government are so tied together. Knowing the sinfulness of man, it was wise that the biblical prescription for government would essentially advocate a limited government. Lastly, democratic socialism fosters jealousy and envy. It encourages vengeance and resentment, essentially teaching people that whatever successful people have, they got it by taking it from somebody else or exploiting somebody else. Thus, via political philosophy, they encourage people to unite politically so that money can be taken from their neighbors and then given to favored constituencies. It's essentially, as one commentator noted, conservative commentator, it's essentially a theft scheme and a means of suppressing the conscience.
Now, I briefly want to close by calling attention to what I haven't spoken about. I haven't spoken about the differences that exist between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party with respect to things like the right to freedom of speech advocated by the Republican Party as opposed to the Democratic, Democratic Party which has embraced cancel culture, uses its relationship to big tech companies such as Google, Facebook, and Twitter to suppress a free exchange of ideas and wanting to villainize or even arguably criminalize speech that it deems immoral and hateful. I haven't spoken about the Second Amendment right of United States citizens to defend themselves and their families by bearing arms. I haven't spoken about the illegal immigration issue and the responsibility that a nation has to enforce its border laws and not have illegal immigrants surpass those who are pursuing legal immigration. I have not spoken also about religious freedom, apart from a brief mention earlier. I haven't spoken about the misrepresentations that have happened within our society. If you were just watching, say, ABC and CNN or MSNBC, you are not getting a full picture of what is going on in our society. And sadly, this kind of ideology is reflected among even prominent evangelicals who will talk about our president, who I will make no excuse for any sinful behavior, nasty words or indiscretions and sinful behavior of the past. But if you're going to go down that route, do you not then talk about the other side of the equation and other issues there, whether it's corruption, whether it's other indiscretions of the past of one kind or another? Do you not take into consideration then the testimony of a candidate or a, a vice president in office like Mike Pence and how he does have a stellar reputation? So you have these misrepresentations and you have these attempts to kind of malign one without proportionately identifying the issues on the other side. So leaving all of those things aside and just giving brief mention to them, I hope that you can see from a biblical perspective why it is inconceivable that a Christian who understands what's going on in the issues and also understands what the scripture teaches about these things, how it's inconceivable that a Christian would support the Democratic Party. And I would argue that thus, conversely, it is the responsibility of Christians, yes, to pray for who's at whoever is in office, 100%, regardless of what the outcome of this election is, and even before, to pray for such individuals. But to take up that right that we do have, not only to pray, but to be salt in society by exercising a vote, that could be yet one more proverbial brick in the wall that is holding back further societal decay in our society. And we do all of this knowing that our citizenship is in heaven. But because our citizenship is in heaven, and because we know that we're serving King Jesus, and because we know that we've been reconciled to God through the death of His Son, we love people, and we want to be salt and light on this earth. And we don't absolve ourselves of the responsibilities that we do have as citizens. And that's just one of the many ways that we can be salt and light for the glory of God and for the good of men and women in our land. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the way in which your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that your word protects us so that we are not conformed to this world, but we can be, by your grace, continually transformed by the renewing of our minds. Father, may you, by your grace, continue to find in our hearts no animosity towards those who raise their fist against you and against us and against the good of men and women and children in our land. May our righteous indignation be mingled with great compassion. And may Heavenly Father, you find us not only properly discerning between good and evil, not only seizing the responsibility that we do have to pursue being light and salt in our culture. And Father, you know that I think one way in which we do that is by voting. Father, I pray that above all things that you will help us to live out these responsibilities knowing that our kingdom is not ultimately of this world. 
and knowing that our King has ascended and He is at your right hand and all authority is given to Him. Hallelujah. So Father, may what we do be a response to what You have already done in sending Your Son. And Father, may the message that we proclaim above all messages be that there is forgiveness for men and women regardless of what side of the political spectrum they are on, there is only one way for men and women to be forgiven and we glorify you that you've made a way through sending your son that whoever believes in him, that his death was the payment for their sins and he was raised from the dead on the third day might be right with you and reconciled to you forever. We love you. We pray these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.